As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? To sleep of labor is sweet, whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them to no sleep. I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that can carry in their hands. This, too, is grievous evil. And everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain, since they toil for the wind? And their days, they, all their days, they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. This is what I have observed to be good, that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot, and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the rain, Father. We thank you for the seasons of the year, Lord. We know that uh, your beauty just goes out throughout the whole earth, Father. Yes. And we thank you for the spring that's coming, Lord. And we thank you for the, the words that you put on our hearts, Father. We thank you for the Lamb of God, your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for his love, Father, that, that he sacrificially went down that path, Father, and, and became sin for us, Father. We just ask your, uh, your Holy Spirit, Father, to continue in our lives, to, to build us up, Father, to help us conquer the, the things that, uh, that trouble us, Father, that keep us from your love, Father. We know, Father, that you have uh, such a crying desire to help us, Father, and we're so grateful, Father, that you want that kind of relationship with us, Father. We're so grateful, Father, for your love, for your compassion that you have for man, Lord. And we just uh, continually, Father, want your Holy Spirit in our lives. And we lift you up this morning. We thank you for a, praise, a place of worship, Father, that we can come and enjoy with one another, brothers and sisters that believe, Father, in the Lord, the Lamb of God, that believe in the Holy Spirit, the coming, Father, the second coming, Father. You once came, Father, as a sacrificial lamb through your Son, but you will come again in glory, Father, as mm -hmm. the King, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And you will give us, Father, that second, that second coming that will present a new heaven and a new earth where there'll be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more trials, just glory and comfort, Father. We thank you for that hope that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In his name we pray, amen. A professor at New College, Kate Eckhorn, a very astute woman. She has composed a book whose uh, premise is we're learning, we're, we're forgetting how to forget. And uh, she composed a book, and you can get it on Amazon today. It's called The End of Forgetting. The End of Forgetting. Well, the premise of the book is that 
the scientists and social media people and engineers and project management people all in involved with the internet are all telling us when you post something on the internet, it's there forever. And um, probably will never be forgotten. And I'll tell you why. It's not gonna be forgotten because in, in, uh, artificial intelligence is catching up. And artificial intelligence is just very powerful computer programs that take all of human knowledge that it can find on the internet in any language, not just English, um, and stores that and uses it in ways that we have yet to comprehend. And all of us are contributing to that. I, for one, am not concerned about um, some government agency or internet um, provider coming after me personally. If they did, they'd have a very boring time. <laughs> but I am a part of the information that goes up on, because I want to put everything good I can up on the internet. On the internet. I personally have talked to uh, GPT chat. It's a, it's a artificial intelligent robot. You can talk to it. It talks back to you. It's very astute. You think you're talking to a person, a very smart person. <laughs> um, if you're interested, I'll show you how to do that, but I don't think you need to do it really. But just know this, that all the stuff that, it doesn't have to be you're typing stuff again your, your computer, it can be on your phone. Or somebody says, I'm, I'm worried about the government tracking me. Well, if, you, if you're worried about the government tracking me, leave your cell phone home. Um, but I'm not worried about that as much as the bigger general picture of things. Some people are very worried about artificial intelligence. Uh, they're worried about GAI, general artificial intelligence, when the thing takes on a life of its own. And they begin to talk to each other. Well, anyway, I'm not so worried about it. It's good in many ways, as it uh, helps with medical science and um, a lot of positive things. But if you're a college student graduating this year and you've been careless with the pictures you've posted and the comments you've made and the pornography you may have looked at and the nasty pictures and the rants and raves um, that you have, uh, your future employer can go find you and they don't have to do much interviewing. They can see who you are by your social media content. And they have this thing called honorability index. And, and so enter this company called Brands Yourself or Student Makeover. With a, for a mere $100, they will scrub your internet social media. And uh, even the stuff that you put uh, done on your phone, they will scrub it and take all the stuff out that doesn't look honorable and uh, scrub you. And they give you, uh, for just $100, they go in there and try to get all your bad stuff out. I have very, very uh, little confidence that they're gonna be successful at doing that. Because the tentacles of the internet are wide and deep. And uh, trailblazing internet companies that you might wanna work with 
If they don't call you back, you might want to look at your internet. And so this is a worry. All of us have done stupid stuff when we're young, which we haven't done. And when I did my stupid stuff, I'm glad it didn't go up on the internet. Have, do you have a photo album at home? How many do you have? Do you have several? We have 10 or 12. Big fat ones. And uh, a couple of years ago, I got all the cardboard boxes that you throw the pictures in and organized them. We, we put them in, a, in some albums. You know, if you want to take a nostalgic trip down memory lane, you get your photo albums out and you picture, you go through them and you look at some pages with people you like very, very long and but some pages you just slip over. You don't want to see those people. <laughs> but you know, that's okay. But the stuff that lives and breathes in electronic data is harmful. That was a premise of Kate Eichlin's book, Living with Social Media, The End of Forgetting. And you don't have to drag the photo album about anymore. You can just go up to your gallery of pictures on the internet and just browse your heart out. And you can't forget anything. Kate says that it's, it's important for us to forget some things. There are some people that have photographic memories that don't forget anything. Mary Lou Redden was one of them. Uh, who was it? Uh, yeah, just several people that never forget anything. They wish they hadn't had that. I have a photographic memory too. I just can't get my film developed. <laughs> or forget to take the lens cap off or something. But we need just to be aware of what's going on. I'm not trying to make anybody worry. But what do we do in the society we live in? Well, we need to be careful. We need to be vigilant, and we need to be righteous. If there's any day for Christians to be living in holiness and righteousness, it's today. Now, you don't hear that message often. We need to live holy. Peter said, be holy, for I am holy. Well, God said it first. And we need to be vigilant and careful. But what's out there, the luggage of your yesterdays becomes too burdensome for you to carry. What do we need? It might not go up on the internet, but it's right here. And right here. Carl Sagan said, the rings of Saturn are all the lost luggage of the airplane airlines. Well, I wish I could send mine there sometime. <laughs> but nonetheless, what do we do with these memories that are going up, being part of artificial intelligence, making, they, are, they even know your DNA. When I say they, I mean, it's not this international conspiracy of they, a bunch of evil people in a room someplace. No, it's, it's people who think they're doing right. And many times they are. It's just the general trend of where we are today. They, if you've done one of those uh, genealogy tests, your DNA is somewhere in the cloud on social media. So, what's the answer? We will not forget. Somewhere in here, and in here, is everything you've done in our lives. Aren't you glad that Jesus paid it all? Yes. All to him I owe. Sin had left us crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Maybe we are living in the day of the dawn of the end of forgetting. 
But the answer for us is redemption. We seek not to forget everything. We seek to bring everything under the lordship of Jesus Christ and let him redeem it all. And then you people on the internet can have a ball. Go ahead. It's under the blood of Christ. We need redemption. We need the redemption that is in Christ Jesus for all the past, all the present, and all the future. And the word redemption, I'm going to show you what that is in a minute in the New Testament. is a very, very interesting word. But let me read some scripture to you. I was going to take you to several places, but just going to skip over some things. Colossians 1, verse, end of 10, verse, uh, verse 11. Paul said to these Christians in the little burg of Colossae, it's not there anymore, a little town in Lycus Valley. I pray that you may be strengthened, might be being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Wait a minute. Qualified me? How'd that happen? He qualified you and me to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us, the King James says, he's translated us. It's a good word in the Greek. It means to have been given a brand new situation. How does that appeal to you? A brand new situation. He translated us into the kingdom of his son, whom he loves, in whom we have what? Redemption. And what? The forgiveness of sins. That's what we do with our past. That's what we do. We just bring it into the blood of Christ under the, under the principles of God, the purposes of God, of his redemption. Verse 19, for God was pleased about Jesus to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself, what? All things. Where the things on earth are things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It says the same thing in Romans chapter 8. The world and the creation is longing for the day of the sons of God to be revealed and for the kingdom of God to fully come and this planet and everything in it and all on it will be will be redeemed fully the very ground you stand on the very landscape you look at will all be redeemed with you because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Somebody say amen. Amen. (laughs) Well, I'm going to skip over some of this because I just want you to see the one thing. You know, we quote this Romans 3.23 a lot. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in trouble. If it weren't for Jesus. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's you and me and everybody else. Misery loves company. But verse 24 said, complete the thought of chapter 3, verse 23 in Romans with chapter uh, verse 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all have been justified. Freely by his grace. You know, Christians sometimes forget 
the adjectives and the adverbs. Listen to this. Here's, a, here's an example. For we all have been justified, what? Freely. Freely. By his grace. Through the redemption. Lutrosis. Her apolutrosis. That came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Now, I've sinned, all have sinned, but those who come to Christ all have been justified freely, freely by his grace. If you read 23, read verse 24 as well. It's very important. Next verse. But now, since you have been set free from sin, how many of you feel like you've been set free from sin? Set free from sin. You know, what this is talking about is set free from the penalty of sin. Set free from the penalty of sin. Now, sin reaches out its ugly tentacles and drags me back toward the pit sometimes. And I have to get my sword of the spirit out and cut that tentacle off. <laughs> but I have been set free from the penalty of sin. I will deal with the consequences of sin, especially when Jesus wants to spank me and make me particular with his holiness. We have been set free from the penalty of sin. We could become the slaves of God. And you have your fruit, which results in holiness, and the end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Many translations rightfully translate that, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So, it's so amazing. So amazing. Well, about 20 years ago in California, I'm not sure where it was. It was in the newspaper. I think I vaguely remember it. A couple of young boys were, they were uh, just exploring in the gold country. And one of them slipped into an abandoned hole and slid so far down into the darkness they couldn't see him anymore and they could barely hear his voice crying for help. His little friend ran and got help immediately and, and the neighborhood kicked in and big machinery was brought out and uh, in just a matter of a day, they were able to retrieve that little explorer uh, and they brought him home to mama she was not happy. She, would love to, she, loved, she loved him. Later on, after he was um, rescued, the reporter said, well, how was your little boy? Well, he was okay. I mean, he was really dirty and hungry. That was her appraisal. But the story goes that in just a few days, they kept him overnight in the hospital, and just a few days, he went to dad, tugged at his sleeves, said, Daddy, I want to go see the hole where I was. He said, what do you want to go back there for? Well, I just want to see where I was in the hole. And so daddy said, OK. And as they approached the place where he slid into that hole and was there for like 36 hours, they saw this mountain of rock and rubble, several of them. And the little guy says, I don't remember those. He says, that's what they dug out to get you. And the little guy said, they did all that for me? And daddy said, yes. He hugged him. He says, because you're important. They dug you out of the darkness. They dug you out from the hole. 
and people love you, and they brought you out of the darkness. Well, we just read in Colossians that Jesus has brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of his son, in the kingdom of his love. That little, that little spelunker came out of that hole. It was embraced by the firemen and set on his way home to the hospital first because they loved him and cared for him. And he was just utterly amazed at the great effort that went into rescuing him. Big machinery still sitting around. And he was humbled. You know what? We should be humbled. Jesus has moved heaven and earth to bring you and I out of the kingdom of darkness. I'm going to give you three R's. We've been rescued, we've been reconciled, and we've been redeemed. That's what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1. Let me tell you another story. This guy named Brian, back in Pennsylvania, a spelunker on purpose, something I will never do. And he loved crawling around those caves. He was a slim guy because he could squeeze through these little holes. It just makes me claustrophobic looking at it. And so he's, and day he's got his light on, he's got his rope behind his back, and he's spelunking, looking for crystals and taking pictures and having a great time. He got this big room he got into, and he's backing up, taking pictures. And all of a sudden, he's on his back, about 20 feet down in this big, dark hole unconscious, never walk backwards with a camera. <laughs> Have you ever fallen down doing that? It's easy to do. Never f walk backwards on a fishing pier. I've done that one. So it brought, this was serious business. They couldn't find him. And because he had s put his slim body through this crack and went into this big room, they didn't know where he was. That's why you don't find many heavyweight spelunkers, because they can't get through those cracks. <laughs> Several hours went by, 24 hours went by, and he snapped awake. But when Brian woke up in utter darkness, as reported by Reader Digest, he was an amnesiac. He didn't know who he was. He didn't know where he was. He was just afraid. He was in that cold darkness. But presently he heard, off in the distance, somebody say, Brian, Brian. And as soon as he heard his name, his whole history came back into his mind. Suddenly he knew who he was. And they were able to retrieve him. He's pretty severely injured. Tough time getting him out of that place. As far as I know, he wants to be like him again. <laughs> That's a, a sport he can have. <laughs> but in the utter darkness, he doesn't know who he is, doesn't know where he is. He's just terrified until someone called his name. Yeah. Brian. I have a hard time doing it. <laughs> then he knew who he was. One day, you and I were in utter darkness. We didn't know really who we were. Jesus knew who we were. We are so occupied with our lives, we forget who we are and the value of who we are. But Jesus has never forgotten the value of who you are. He knows how important you are. He knows how important that kid that fell in that hole was. But sometimes we forget the value of who we are to Jesus. And in that utter darkness, one day the Holy Spirit says, John. And I wake up. And I'm born again. And my spiritual memory comes back. Because now I know the voice of my Savior who calls me out of darkness 
into his marvelous light, as it says in Colossians chapter 1. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Christians, we don't sometimes remember just how uh, in dangerous territory we used to live and be and have our being. We were in the dominion of darkness. Let me tell you, the dominion of darkness is very real. Stay away as far from that as you can. Anything to do with the occult or witchcraft or any of that, or just plain old being a sinner, get away from that as far as you can because that's the dominion of darkness and we've been called out of that. Jesus has called our name. He's lifted us out of the pit of the mire of clay and set our feet on the rock to stay, as, as David says. We have been rescued from the dominion of darkness. We have been reconciled to the Father. There's so many stories of families and especially sons who get alienated from their father. Maybe because their father did something stupid and mean. And maybe the kid did something that was just outrageous and the father re overreacted. Sometimes the daughters more, more than likely get alienated from their mother and sometimes go for years without, I don't want to hear her name. I don't want to see that picture. I'm with my photo album. I'm skipping past that page. I don't want to see that person. They're alienated. Christian, I want to ask you something today. Is there anyone in your life that you feel alienated against? You need to get up to that person and heal that relationship because that's the people that, that we are. We are the people of reconciliation. You and I have been recon reconciled to the Father. We were in the realm of darkness. He rescued us. And then we realized we need to come back to the Father. Just like the prodigal son who woke up in the pigsty and said, why am I here? And he ran back to the father, and the father ran back to him, clothed him, put a ring on his finger, and accepted him back, and he was reconciled with his father. You know, we should be people of reconciliation with our father, with our earthly father, with our spiritual family, anybody in the kingdom of God that you don't want to that you feel kind of angry about. We need to get that straight. And the sooner, the better. We have been reconciled to the Father. He has received us. He has, and I like to say this, I hope you don't get tired of saying it, he has set a place at his table for us. When my kids left home, well, they didn't leave home like look at his split. Well, they got older and older, and they began to skip dinners. Oh, I got to go out with my friends. We're going to go to the burger place. And the table was set by Mama, and there it sat. It was a sad thing to see that place setting. You know, everybody's got to live their own life. They got to grow and get out on their own. But it, it's, a, it's a tearing. I wonder about parents who say, I can't wait for those kids to get out of the house. <laughs> no. That should grieve you. There should be tears. There should be some heartache about that. And there's heartache in the heart of the Father because he wants to be reconciled with us. And that has happened with the Father because of what the Lord Jesus has done. Jesus said, the Father's going to say, Come, ye blessed of my Father. Come, ye blessed of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. Come, ye blessed of my Father. And I'm looking at all you and I'm saying, come, ye blessed of my Father. Come to the table of God. You have been reconciled to God. We should rejoice in that. It's not anything to be casual about. 
It should be something that warms our hearts to know that we're, you know, this, you can talk about theology of reconciliation. You can talk about theology of rescue. But how about living it in our own heart and life? Heal any relationship that you have that's broken. The sooner the better. Paul said in Romans chapter 12, As much as in you lies, live at peace with all men. That includes the people you don't like and those in your own family. (laughs) Be at peace. As much as in you lies, live at peace. I'm not thinking about anybody here. I'm just thinking about me. And then we've been reconciled to the Father, but we have been redeemed forever. Let me show you what the New Testament calls redemption. The Greek word for redemption is lutrosis or apolutrosis. Now, I don't want you to write this down and think about it, but it just means this, to pay the full price a ransom to make someone free. Neutrosis means to pay the price. Apolutrosis means to pay the very last cent and set that person free. That's what Jesus has done for us. He shed his blood He did not spare one drop of his blood or one drop of his pain to set us free and to set us on our way to heaven for free. Hallelujah. And there's another term. Agarazzo or ex agarazzo. It means to buy for yourself. The agora was the marketplace. And they had these big hunks of meat with flies all over them and garbage and not a, not a pleasant place in most, time, most times. But if you wanted something for yourself, you went to the Agora and you did an agorazzo. You bought something for yourself. You paid the price. And you, or you, want, you went to, to buy a slave and set them free on their way. It's like Schindler's List. Remember that? He couldn't pay enough. He just scratched the money. That's a true story. But ex agarozo means go to the marketplace, buy something for yourself, pay the full price, and get the stink, get the, get the stinking place behind you. Ex agarozo. Take it home. Now, I can go to the marketplace and buy a slave and set him free, or I can take my, go to the marketplace and buy a slave, bring him home, sit at my table, give him some food, let him take a bath, you know, get him clean, get him accepted, and to say, is, is there anything I can do for you before you take off? On your way, off with you. You're free now. That happens more than you realize. The slavery in the world today. But you and I, I think you know where I'm going with this. Jesus went to the marketplace to buy something for himself. And he did an ex agarazzo. He bought us, cleaned us up, and took us out of the stinking place and set us on our way. Off with you in the world. Live your life in Christ. He paid the last dime of his blood for you and me. That's redemption. And all the past that you, we were thinking about to begin with, you know, the end of forgetting, it's all done. The answer to our luggage from the past that burdens us down is the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeems us. And we are free. Jesus went to the marketplace. He bought us. He got us out of the sticking place. Cleaned us up. Took us home. Put us at his table. And he's made us free in him.
just this. I hear people say, Pastor, I just need to know God's will. I just want to know God's will. How can I know God's will? And I say to them, what makes you think God's obligated to tell you his will? He didn't have to tell you his will. You just live his will. You hear behind you the voice of God saying, this is the way. This is the way. Walk in this way. You know, God is more merciful than to show us his will. Sometimes he shows us his will, car blanche, it's out there, you see it. Many times, if God showed us his will, we have an option. I can do it or not. But God says, I'm not giving you that option. Uh -uh. I'm just going to guide you, as the Bible says, as the path of the justice, as a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. And so when the slave was set free, he was free. And God will bless you in the decisions of your life as long as you are, your heart is pure toward God. How good is that? He has called your name out of darkness. He has set you at the table of the Father. He has taken you home and cleaned you up and set you free. That's redemption. That's our privilege. That's our honor. I'm so glad to be a Christian, aren't you? It's not complicated. It's just God's will. The Bible says, Whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you called on the name of the Lord? Before we leave here today, will you call? Call on Jesus. You say, Pastor, already did that. Doesn't hurt you to freshen that up. Jesus, we call on you. We thank you for the day you called us out of darkness. We thank you for the day you set us at the table. We thank you for the day you went to the marketplace and took us out of that stinking place and changed our lives. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? amen.
Hey, Joe, can you hear me? You can hear every word.